You're listening to Don't Waste Water. It's not very modest, and I'm trying to be humble, but I do think we do have the best technology of the market. I did, maybe you hear this a few times before, but this time is true. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. If you say, when can we go to industrialization? I don't know my colleagues but we can go to industrialization right now and we hope to sign the first contract this year. You know, to sign a contract, it doesn't depend only in your technology. It really depends on many other things moving in the lithium world. But we hope to sign a contract this year for an industrial plant, of course. I'm your host, Antoine Walter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Gabriel Toffani as my guest. The world will need lithium in any case. The price we have today, most of the South American brands, we can still make profitable competitive plants. You can look at that as an opportunity. As I told you, we believe we have a very low capex and opex, so we said maybe this will even be a booster for our technology because there will be a selection. Gabriel is the CEO of Adionix. If you ask me what's going to happen with the 50 or 60 DLE companies today, I guess in the coming years will be like in a lot of markets, a consolidation and maybe in a few years you will have, I wouldn't say three, but maybe 10. And those will be, of course, the more performant and the more competitive. Adionix is committed to revolutionizing the lithium industry by offering a cleaner and more sustainable direct lithium extraction technology. This episode is by no means about Suez, but I believe the following is a piece of context that's important to understanding today's conversation. As he'll tell you in a minute, Gabriel has been with Suez for 32 years and an executive at Suez for 24 of these 32 years. At the time of the famous Veolia Suez merger I covered as hot news in the first season of this podcast, Gabriel was managing several hundreds of people. He had just finished merging 12 business units into his global projects department in the US and he had just opened a 300 engineer office in Bangalore. Yet, like almost all the former executives of Suez, he felt like it was time for a new challenge for him. The reason why I'm bringing this up is to highlight the meaning of the new challenge he picked. Someone his profile with unparalleled experience in design and build and a track record over three continents in doing so would have had an easy time getting an executive role in almost any EPC company in the current wave of large private public partnership projects. Yet, he took a fully different direction. He became the CEO of an 18 headcount startup developing an underdog direct lithium extraction technology out of France. And I say underdog with great benevolence towards the absolutely promising technology Adionix is developing, just to highlight how, if you recall the various generations of direct lithium extraction technologies, the solvent extraction approach Adionix is pushing is really not the dominant process yet. As you'll hear today, though, that technology that was successfully piloted almost in another life as a desalination game changer in the Master Incubator project, I should tell you about that one one day, has strong merits in that race to feed the world with the lithium it needs for its green revolution. And if you need proof of that beyond my words, well, end of last year, SQM, the world's second largest traditional lithium player, led Adionix $27 million Series B. So what's so special about Adionix? How do they intend to roll out their technology? What's happening in San Antonio de los Cobres? What's on the horizon? Well, let's answer all of those questions and more with Gabriel. Right before that, if you like this episode, please share it with a friend, a colleague, your boss or your team, and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Gabriel. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm pumped up about that conversation because you won't remember me, but I remember you. We crossed path in Salta last year at the Panorama Mineral Conference. You were speaking there and I was just sneaking on you, hoping to get to catch you. And at the moment, I thought I was able to grab you you were leaving the building and entering a taxi. Okay, so that's not too late. Sorry about that. Thanks for having me first. And then sorry about the salt that I was not aware about. But <laughs> it's now nice to know it. But since then, you know, I wanted to go into the core of your technology. What's your number one challenge which you're solving? If you just had to give me one reason why your technology is the killer one, what would it be? I need to give you a few reasons because it's a whole. So let's say if I should give one, it's extremely selective, right? Which makes it simple to use. And then once that you go from lithium chloride to 
lithium carbonate that makes that part very simple and cheap. But of course, being very selective means that we have a very high yield, the high purity, we have the low water consumption. Maybe I will tell you then why did I came to Adionics, but at the moment I decided to came, the technology was a very important thing. And at that time, I did believe what they told me, which Guillaume, the founder, told me. It's not very modest, and I'm trying to be humble, but I think we do have the best technology of the market. I did, maybe you hear this a few times before, but this time is true. Actually, your technology has something which is for sure very different from all the other ones we've covered so far. It's that you do solvent extraction and we covered membranes. We covered all the different types of adsorbents, which you could be using to extract lithium. But that's the first time I'm covering in solvent extraction when I think you're not fully alone, I would expect Solvay to do something around that as well. But the way you do it, I would give it to you that you sound to be the only ones. Do you feel like the pioneer or do you feel like alone? We feel that kind of unique technology. You cannot really compare it to the others. I don't know in detail all the others, but I prefer to talk about our technology. And once again, we do think it is a very, very good one. So before we go into the full story, what would be your best elevator pitch to Adionix? Adionix not only we have a good technology, but now we did try it with industrial pilots in real conditions, and we show that it is working. So my best elevator pitch to mining companies is that we are ready to go. I mean, everything is okay. We can do an industrial plant tonight. So it's ready. Well, give your elevator pitch, that gives me a good way to enter into the depth of it, because your pilots on their technical notes, it's written, they are built for operation at 5,000 meters, which kind of gives you a hint as to where you intend them to go into play. How did you come to that conclusion that your place was mostly in the lithium triangle? Well, I don't know if I tell 5,000 meters because there are not many places, but at least there are many miles of 3,800 and so on. We communicate on that. We already made tests in Atacama at 2,500. And then we build the pilot considering the altitude. So all the technical decisions were done to try to adapt the pilots to real conditions. As you might notice, we are waiting and we will have it soon, a piece of land in San Antonio. So we will install a pilot at 3,800 meters. And of course, people can doubt about this. that going to work or not at that height. So I just give you a new rendezvous where we will start the pilot in San Antonio and it will work because once again, the people, our technicians, our process guys thought about that when they designed the pilot. So it was done for that. We knew that our big market was the lithium triangle, right? When you say that you will have your own pilot in San Antonio, does that mean that you are the lithium developer there and you go end to end? Or is it just a demo plant to prove the technology, but you don't intend to build a 20,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent plant? We are not a kind of mining company today. Now, the idea with that site in San Antonio is to have a demo plant and industrial demo plant could be, we have a 15 tons one and 250 tons one, will be one of them or maybe both one day. So the idea in the beginning is to bring brines from different mines around, make the test, show that the process is working, show that the, the steady process, because when we make tests it's 24 hours a day during one, two, three, four weeks, whatever, to show that not only that the results are okay, but the process is easy to handle. And then maybe one day when the process, everybody will be convinced that this is working and we have industrial plants, we will transform that maybe in, in a training center or something like that. But we are not going to produce lithium there. No, not the idea. You mentioned that the, this specific region in the lithium triangle is the natural place for you to go. But if I understand right, your technology, it can go from 50 ppm up to 50,000 ppm of lithium. As much as I agree with you that the only place where you would find these super high concentrations is in the lithium triangle, at 50 ppm, basically any produced water fields, oil fields in the Middle East or in Canada would suit as well. So why did you focus on the place where evaporation pumps, after all, work pretty well. We can treat uh, brines on the range you mentioned. 
we need to be also competitive. You know, you did speak to 20 DLE companies, but I think there are more than 50 today. So we are in a market where you need to run to be the first. You need to show that you are good, but you need to show that you are competitive. It's a business, right? So we are very competitive, maybe at 200, 250 milligrams. And the more we go up in concentration, the more we will be efficient and competitive. We are looking to go to a lower end because Flyonex, there's not only one single product. We will have few of them. So we are making new research to go down and down in concentration. But while we find the perfect formula for 50 milligrams, we are addressing today something starting at 200, 250 milligrams up to how much you want, as you mentioned, 50 grams or something like that is possible. Flyonex is your technology. Can we explain how that works? I'm not a chemistry, I'm not the founder, and I'm not a searcher. I'm just an engineer, and I'm just a water engineer. First, let me tell uh, things that I find magic about the Flyonex. The molecules of Flyonex were created here in our labs there downstairs, right? There are molecules that did not exist before. So the guys started to create a milligram and then a few grams. Then kilograms that we use in our pilots, and we are able to make tons and tons for an industrial plant. So it's a product that was totally created by the ideas of Guillaume de Souza, the founder and the Adionics chemical research team. So how does it work? It's a liquid. You have the first step where you put the brine in contact with our fly and uh, few technologies. If the concentration in the brine is about a low one, we use mixer settlers. Mm -hmm. If it's a high one, we use centrifuge, but which are not our proprietary equipment. Those are market equipment. The same as the mining company used for other purposes, the same equipment. So that's the first step. The Flyonex will extract the lithium. And when I said it is a very selective liquid, it means that we will not extract boron, potassium, magnesium, nothing, because it's impossible for the fly. Like we will extract a little bit of sodium and calcium, but all the rest, we will not even touch it. No extraction at all. That's why we think we know it will be a very pure lithium chloride. Second step, it's a kind of washing with a little bit of water. Because the fly on X is already very pure, we will just try to remove any impurity in a second washing step. And the third one, the fly on X has all the lithium in it. So we need to release the lithium. So in the column, we have a countercurrent uh, fly on eggs and pure water. And then the lithium chloride is already pure going to the production. And the fly on eggs goes around all the time, goes back to the extraction, washing, regeneration, and like that. I know that's prior to you joining the company, but just for me to understand how Adionics, which if I'm right, stands for Advanced Ionic Solutions. Yeah. I'm curious to understand when you understood that lithium was your home game. Because from the date, if I'm right, the pivot was in 2017 to lithium extraction. Yeah. And 2017 is a time where the lithium price was very low. So it was a bold move in 2017 to do that pivot towards lithium. Many have done the pivot in 2022. Cool for them, but it makes a lot of sense when you see that the price goes through the roof. What's the backstory there? The initial idea of Guillaume was to be able to give drinking water to the whole world. Drinking water coming from desalination, right? They even make a pilot with Suez in Mazdar and there were another pilot. So I I guess even if the desalination was working very good, the desalination space was already very busy with big groups as the French ones and many others. There are groups all around the world doing desalination. So I think to get a main place in that world and be very competitive maybe was a little bit complicated. And in that time, the vision of Adion was to say lithium is going to develop, is going to be very important, and we do have a great solution for that. So the trip was on 2017, which means that we are working on that for about seven years. And I think it's a good thing, because if we are ready to industrialization today, it's because we are working on that space for a long time, right? I don't know if the, those who switch in 20, they are ready for industrialization, but it took at the end of time, time to get where we are today, right? You mentioned industrialization, and that is the big topic when it comes to DLE. 
I'm an avid watcher of the lithium sphere. I'm by no means a big expert in lithium, but I think I listen to every single episode of Jolori's podcast. And he regularly takes a shot on DLE and says, hey, by the way, is DLE happening at full scale? And he's right on that, that there is no commercial plans doing DLE end to end. So how big of a topic is industrialization? And when do you think that one company, be it you or another, will be doing an end-to-end. -end. Well, you have already kind of DLE working with the Arcadium DLEs in Argentina with resins and so on. And I guess I'm sure Eramed is going to start the plant also. But they are using their technology for their own, right? And in the competitive space, as you say, there's no industrial plant. So when I'm telling you that we are ready for industrialization, it means that we went through a process that with the pilot plan, we certify that the process is working. And also we did go through a basic engineering project to confirm what do we need as industrial equipment, which is the exact capex and trying to guess the exact opex. We did already that. We are ready for industrialization. So if you say, when can we go to industrialization? I don't know my colleagues. But we can go to industrialization right now, and we hope to sign the first contract this year. You know, to sign a contract, it doesn't depend only in your technology is ready. It depends on many other things moving in the lithium world. But we hope to sign a contract this year for an industrial plant, of course. Usually, when you look at the marketing materials of a DLE company, I'm not saying you, you're the exception so far. There is this table with the technology of everybody is stacked in columns on an OPEX price chart. And then everybody's on the right. And then the company which is doing that presentation is on the very left and is much cheaper than everybody else. And then you move to another company and they have the same chart, except that they are now the one on the very left and they are the cheapest. I have a hard time with silver bullets. I don't believe that someone can solve everything. And you were very straightforward by saying at the beginning, what's the right concentration at which you have the best efficiency today. That's a lot of points in my personal scoring. So kudos for that. But where would you expect to land in terms of OPEX if you are blessed with a brine which goes to your ideal conditions for FlyNX? Well, I wouldn't say this confidential information, but it's very difficult to answer to that question. And I guess I will not. Sorry about that. Let me explain you why. We are willing to do what we know how to do, right? So what we are going to do with the mining company, we'll have always our process engineer look in the process, and then you need a little percentage of refill of our fly on it every year. So we will guarantee that, that just a few percent, and we will do it. Then you have local issues like what's the price of the water, what's the price of the kilowatt, and so on. So I cannot tell you about that. So it depends on many, many different things. We are not going to operate the plant. We are just going to give process support and fly on it refill. For that part, I could give you the, the figure. But they are just inside of something which is bigger and we don't count for that. First, that answer, I think I even prefer it to if you had just given me a number because that makes a lot of sense. Talking of the way to develop a project, you mentioned how you would have process people looking at a brine, looking at a composition, then probably do some lab test. When do you start? So what's the beginning of your scope? At what stage should a mining company reach out to you so that you can look at what they're doing and up to where do you go? So you don't do operation, you said that, but what do you deliver? Is it like the process and then they would have a company to install everything or would you do like a turnkey solution and then they operate? A mining company, we can start talking when they just ask the question to themselves, are we going to keep on making evaporation or we want to look at DLE or what do we want to do? When they have the composition of their brine, or even if they guess which is going to be the composition of the brine, with all the tests we performed in the last year, we build a mathematical model. So if you send me the composition of your brine tonight, I can tell you tomorrow, not the ideal solution. I can propose you curves with many solutions. If you want more purity than yield or more yield than purity, we can choose together which is your exact point. And for that point, we will give you the result of what our deal is going to do. And a rough idea about the our part of CAPEX and OPEX, and I will come back to the CAPEX and OPEX. So that's the first step. And with the years, our model is 
always correct at one, two, three percent different because we make a lot of lab tests to correct the model. Second stage, I'm talking to you from uh, Les Julies, which is south of Paris. We do have a, quite a big lab here. So we have a, a pile, the exact, the exact same process as in the industrial pilots, but in the lab, which is very good because it's a glass pilot. So you can see the fly on edge, the water mixing. If you come and you are kindly invited to come, you see the process and you will understand everything very fast. So second step is to propose to the client to do, we call it a clean lithium one because we put a number with the tones equivalent to lithium chloride that we can produce every year. If you leave the lab working the whole year, we produce one ton, right? That's why the other pilots, we call them CL15 and CL250. Then we can go to the CL15 and we can go also on site as we did with uh, our shareholder SPM. We made the test in real conditions, right? So what are we going to propose to the mining company? Of course, we'll perform ourselves the basic engineering or the process book or call it as you want. We will define the process, the size of the main equipment to be able to guarantee that the process is going to work. That's what we know how to do. Then we are not contractors, we are not an erection company, we don't know anything about pipes. So we will need a kind of EPC constructor that we take care of detailed engineering and we can supervise, of course, and that they will define how many, uh, how big are the pipes, instruments, cables, whatever you want. We are not specialists in that, so we will not do that. We will just supply the basic engineering. Of course, the first field of Flyonex, we will manufacture that and provide that to the client. The three main equipments, we will buy them because there's equipment from well-known suppliers, but we have a spec for that because it's particular for our utilization. And that's it. Then we will spend process engineering on the side for startup commission. We need to make a refill of fly on it during the operation of the plant. And also the brine can change, the conditions can change. So we propose to have a continuous process survey that we help the mining company to get, you know, continuous improvement on the process that they get always what they want to get. Let me tell you one word about the second model that we are proposing. And that's based also in our all water experience. We are proposing a kind of BOT, BOO model. If a junior miner doesn't want to deal with financing, we propose them to find investors, create a special purpose company. We should be with a little percentage in the special purpose company. We'll find people that want to invest money in the project and the special purpose company. We subcontract to Adionic the technology, to an EPC contractor, the EPC, to an operator, the operation, and so on. So that's the second model that we are trying to address as well. But the base model is the technology partner, and that's it. You mentioned the technology partner. You are currently, or you have finished building your CL250 in Latin America. Did you pick someone which will be your partner for all future projects of this kind? Or are you fully agnostic? Whoever is able to put a seed and a frame together is able to put your process together. Just a word, this heel 250, we did run it in North France. Now waiting to go, hopefully to San Antonio de los Cobres, but it is still in a French port, okay? We have two CL15. One is in Germany because we have a partnership with a company called Kutek Countech because they are making the carbonation. I mean, we are not married, we don't work always together, but you know, the interesting thing is that the mining company in South America can send brine and we do DLE and carbonation at the same place if they want to make the whole process. And then the second CL15 is moving right now from Atacama to Salta, to North Argentina. That will be installed soon because it's uh, faster to move and we do have the place to install it already. Okay, I have a curiosity question here because your pilot is moving from Chile to Argentina. It's called the lithium triangle, which means there are three parts of the triangle. Yes, sir. And your technology is super selective so that it doesn't really bother with everything which is mixed with the lithium or not as much as other technologies would. That has always been the drawbacks of Bolivian brines that they are mixed with a lot of stuff. It's not the only reason why Bolivia is not producing, but it's one of the reasons why Bolivia is not producing. When I'm hearing what your technology does, it sounds to me like you would have probably a very good solution for Bolivia. 
Is Bolivia somewhere on the map for you? Or do you say, ah, there's more than just technology at play here? Wait and see. In Bolivia, we have for a few years now an agreement with one with universities. We did work with them on Bolivian brines with excellent results. And in the last, we are present in the... In the tender? In the tender of, of a great LB. So we are looking to Bolivia, of course. We are looking to the three sides of the triangle. We would like to be present in the three of them, of course. Before I go to the elephant in the room, because you mentioned that QM already a couple of times, I have to give you that stupid personal anecdote. I mentioned that I was chasing you in Salta. I was together with my colleague from Argentina, and he just looked you up on Google. And the first thing he saw is that you're based in Les Ulysses, but on Avenue des Ondes. And to him, that was like, of course. And I'm wondering, is it a coincidence? Like you picked a building and then it happened to be Avenue des Ondes? Or did you really pick it because, hey, if you're targeting the lithium triangle and all the end is, you have to be based in Avenue des Ondes. You know, there's two entrants. The other is Avenue du Tour du Feu. Though we didn't pay to the major to change the name of the road. It's a coincidence, but it's a nice uh, coincidence, right? It's a good icebreaker, I guess, when so you discuss we, we will stay here for a long time. Okay, two, a bit more of a serious question. You've been raising $27 million from a group of investors whose lead investor was SQM, which yep. means now... SQM is a major investor in Adionics. SQM is, for a while, looking at ways to increase the yield of their lithium production in Atacama, where today they use only evaporation ponds. Are the two linked? And you would be very logically going into SQM Futuro and start developing something in Atacama. Or is it just SQM is interested in cool people? I had Salinity Solutions on that microphone just two weeks ago, and SQM invested in them, even though it's not for lithium topics, it's for water topics. So how linked are those two elements that they are running a potential DLE project and that they invested in you? SQM was for us before they invest already a prospect because we were talking to them for a long time. We were expecting to perform tests and so on. So to be honest, I don't have the answer to your question. You know that the situation in Chile is changing because SQM has a concession until 2030. They announced publicly that they are dealing with Codelco. They are supposed to sign an agreement. But our everyday life is to give the best service as we can to SQM. I don't know which are their intentions for the future. And not only with SQM, right? Because we are commercially working with everybody. So, of course, SQM is a shareholder and we are trying to give them extra super excellent service. And we are trying to do the same with the other companies, of course. Then the other side of the question is, you raised $27 million. What do you want to do with that money? There are a few things. First of all, of course, we need to run the company and we need finance for that. Today, we are commercializing just the test, which gives us some income, but not enough. Maybe you realize that we were two years ago about 20 people. We are 50 today. So that has to cost. And then we want to reinforce our commercial press. We have a very small commercial team. So we are trying to develop our commercial forces on one side. And on the other, even if we have the fly on X model we need for the brands we are addressing today, we have a lot of research subjects that we want to develop and that costs money. We are trying to develop more efficient fluonate for lower or higher concentrations, lower to be competitive, higher to be even more competitive. We are also addressing the lithium battery recycling subject. We are trying to extend the use of our technology to the hard rock market as well. And then you can imagine more. So we are going to invest also in reserve. And last but not least, we might need CAPEX to have more pilots for demonstration. So we might invest the part of that in new pilots, right? You mentioned two things here. One which I had spotted, which is the battery recycling thing. So I'll come to that later. Let's take the other one, which I had not spotted. How do you play into hard rock in the value chain of spodumene? At what stage can your technology come into play? We are talking about a liquid-liquid technology, so we are not going to make a rock liquid. Of <laughs> <laughs> now, after lithiation, there's the same in the black mass. You need to make lithiation, and then we can go with our technology. So the hard rock will depend how many stages you have, how complex is your process after lithiation, and we will have places where we think we can be competitive. This is a kind of 
end of research subject. We are not ready to industrialize, but we will be in the next months or years. So that means just a wild guess that you're coming into the value chain of lithium refining. So after lixiviation, that means you would be competing with ion exchange and this kind of technologies. And depending on the complexity and the impurities, which are at that stage, you might be more competitive than ion exchange on specific cases. Yeah. And we always have the advantage that we produce very pure lithium chlorides or maybe in the future lithium sulfate, which is not today a lot the case in the battery lithium recycling, right? So that will, we hope, give us an advantage. Battery recycling is Europe's bet. I don't know if anyone really formalized that that way, but again, from my point of view, when you look at the way Europe developed its value chain, the bet is if recycling becomes big enough, then Europe can reduce its dependency on yeah. the, the other geographies. Is that the wave you intend to ride or do you also target other geographies? I cannot say we are geography agnostic because it's not true. Our focus 99.9% is the lithium triangle and those brines, right? Then we will try to address battery recycling all over, right? We don't have a vocation to be just European, so we could do that in the US will be a lot of recycling companies, but... Of course, that will allow us to work in Europe as well, but uh, we are not focusing just on European market. 99.9% .9 of your focus is on South America. Yes, sir. I closed a narrative arc last year when I published my video on the topic. You probably didn't see it. I won't blame you for that. Just to give you a bit of context. Yeah. I'm coming from the east of France. In the east of France, we used to have potash mines. Those potash mines were developed by the same people that later developed the potash mines in Atacama, which ended up being what we know today as both Albemarle and SQM operations in Atacama. So that's the link between both of them. It happens that when those mines closed, they kept doing some analysis of the water inside. And it turns out there's quite a lot of lithium in those potash mines, 400 ppm. When I'm hearing that your sweet spot starts north of 250, yes, sir. I would expect that I give you a ring and I say, look, I have three cubic meters of that brine and 400 ppm lithium, would you be interested or would you tell me, ah, 99.9% .9 means we don't have the bandwidth to take a crazy guy story out of Eastern France? Let's explain to your uh, public that in France, people coming from Marseille used to exaggerate. So I'm not coming from Marseille, but it looks like it's not 99.9 .9 lithium triangle because we are addressing projects in the US as well, but from brines, right? And uh, you know what? One of the brines we are addressing now is from a potash company. We already made tests and with excellent results. So we are trying to go further on that. I cannot tell you much more, but the answer to that client should be, of course. And we did the answer already. In terms of company building, when you joined, were there already 20 people or was that prior to the Series B? Well, when I joined two years and something ago, we were something like 18, I guess. So, so now you're opening an arm in South America? Yeah, in Argentina. Argentina. I guess it's probably the first time that Adionix builds another office abroad. So how do you build that? Because there are lots of time zone difference, a lot of thousands of kilometers. We are going to show technology in real conditions there. So we need to be there. That's not too possibility. So we started opening a subsidiary in Argentina. We might do the same in Chile. And we hired to start a, a manager. And now we have six engineers. I knew the manager from my former life. So that confidence is very important when you are far away. Not that difficult. So that's running very well. We have very good engineers there. They did run the test in Atacama. They are going to run the pilots in North Argentina with local people, right? We have two people in Chile, four in Argentina, so... I know that one should not obsess over the lithium spot price in China, that it's just one temperature of the water or whatever we want to call it, not the temperature of the full ocean. Yet, it is true that it is down. We're back to roughly the same levels than it was in 2017, 2018. Yeah. When I left Salta last year, so roughly, I guess, at the same time that you left Salta, each region had 20 projects in the development. And with the current lithium price, it seems like it's slowing down. Are you feeling that as well? And does it have implication on your 
daily business. We are feeling the same. Some companies, even big companies, officially declare they are slowing down. So yes, we do feel that. Then we can guess whatever you want is going to go up or not soon or not. I'm not going to make any guess because it's not my business. But the world will need lithium in any case. The price we have today, most of the South American brands, we can still make profitable competitive plants. You can look at that as an opportunity. As I told you, we believe we have a very low capex and opex. So we said maybe this will even be a booster for our technology because there will be a selection. You know, when the lithium was a $90 kilogram, even if you need to heat the whole of frying at 80 degrees, you could pay that. And in two years, you got your money back. Today, it's much more selective, right? So maybe that will be a boost for our technology and I hope it will. That's my point. That's why I wanted you to, to have your opinion. It's that when the lithium price was stupidly high or incredibly high, depending how you want to see it, we saw that very low value assets were developed like lepidolite mines. And also we saw that the high-end DLE were not pushed that much because if the price is so high, what you want to do is produce as fast as possible and push it out to the market because whatever it costs you, if you can sell it, you make making money. And so there was a big revival of all the, let's call it Doe style DLE. So the 60, 60s patent from Doe, what Livent is doing uh, in, in Argentina and what some are doing in China, because that works. That's proven to work. We know that it can't be the most efficient, but it works. If now you have to be selective because yeah, you still have to be profitable. You're not pushing out lithium in the market just to lose money. I would see that as a win for you. I think this could be a boost for us. And then if you ask me what's going to happen with the 50 or 60 DLE companies today, I guess in the coming years will be like in a lot of markets, a consolidation. And maybe in a few years, you will have, a, I wouldn't say three, but maybe 10 and those will be, of course, the more performant and the more competitive. And of course, we think we are going to be one of those three or ten, right? Because of our technology and of our cost. Let me give you a devil's advocate question here. And then I'll leave you in peace with that question. <laughs> Let's assume that this new generation of DLE makes it. When I had that conversation with Ben Sparrow from Saltworks, he was saying generation one is this dough style. Generation two is when you backwash with acid, but it's still an adsorbent. And yeah. then generation three would be membranes, ion exchange, solvent extraction. Now, one of these generation three technology makes it big time. Let's say lilac makes it big time and ion exchange becomes the big thing. Would that be problematic to you? Because you're not doing ion exchange. You're doing something which is probably in the same waters in terms of CAPEX and OPEX, but if the market is risk averse and one of your incumbent technologies makes it big time, then maybe why take the risk for something which is slightly better, maybe? If I take your case uh, exactly as you are describing, it could be a problem, but I'm not quite sure that in the real life, what I think is going to happen is that at least one company in each technology are very advanced and will be in, let's say, two or three years, plants running with at least one of each of the existing good processes, including ours. And then we will see the reality, who is working and who is not. So I don't think this will go for a single DLE technology, it will be as I told you, between three and ten, that will develop and there will be space for those three to, let's say, three to five go. <laughs> to round off that deep dive, I have a personal question for you because we shortly discussed before starting the recording about our respective past. We've been working for the same company, not at the same level. I was like the guy just next to the door and you were on the top of the food chain. That's but not why I didn't talk to you in salt. That adventure is very cool, <laughs> right? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but to be serious, you, you've had a, an impressive career amongst De Grémont, Suez, and all those layers. It's a big leap of faith in 2022 to say, I believe in that Adionic company, which is 18 people by the time you join, that's going to make it big time and I'll go do that. So what drives you to that leap of faith? I was only 32 years in the Swiss group, you know, many countries around the world. In one moment, I felt it was okay, it was enough. I was not going to be CEO of the group. We were going to be sold to Veolia, which is another subject. I mean, I like a lot the Veolia people, but so I just said, let's go to do something different. And I did look to a lot of startups, to be honest. And once again, I don't know, it was a fit with Adionis, Adionis board, Yom, the technology. This looks a bit as water treatment as 
knows or it's not completely different but enough. And once again, after two and a half years, I'm very happy because all what I've been told before coming, it was like that and it's true. I am in the, I hope not in the end of my career, but near, right? I'm 65 years old. So, I mean, I think nothing to show to nobody. And then having a lot of fun, Adion has a great team, you know? So it's a pleasure after all those years working in a big group to be in a startup and trying to help things to get down for what at the end, what we want is Tadionic succeed, but helping the green mobility, which is, I think, a good subject, right? So that means that your North Star is that in 5, 10, or whenever you want to put the big KPI, your way to measure if you were successful or not is the impact you will have on the green mobility. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how do you measure that? If there's a lot of uh, lithium produced in the triangle, but everywhere else in a very green way, that will be the way to measure it. And of course, if Adionix is the DLE leader from far, that will head to that. So I hope both things will happen. I said it was the last question. I lied. I have one more just on this DLE topic, just because I want to wash that off of my head. I had a conversation a few weeks ago with Carlos Galli from Lithium Americas at the Global Water Summit. I hope I'm not breaching any secret here. But we were discussing water use and how that's important. And I see that that's clearly one of the perks of your technology. So I'm thinking, could you also be a combination with evaporation ponds in places which already have evaporation ponds anyways, that they would be just increasing their efficiency by bolting on a DLE technology, which happens to not consume too much water, which is sometimes the drawback of DLE? Yeah, of course. We can do that. And we are studying two places where we could pre-concentrate with, the, with existing ponds and then just get the concentrate brines, which I told you we are much more efficient. So the answer is yes, of course. Well, Gabriel, it's been a pleasure to spend that deep dive with you. Thanks a lot for the openness. I have a last series of questions to, to round out this interview, which is the rapid fire questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. My first one is, what is the toughest challenge, in your opinion, for a water tech startup? It's uh, definitely to hire the right people. That's a completely important thing. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1,000 early stage water startups? I tell you, I'm a very humble person and I don't think I can give any advice, but I said hire the right people. And I think when you are the CEO, you just make that people happy and the company is going to work. And then, of course, from this CEO place, I think you need two things. Hear your clients and hear your boards, make your people happy and that's enough. So you see, you can work three, four hours a day, do that, and that's fine. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? That the real future of the lithium production from Bryce is the DLE. That's the future, not the evaporation. I'll take a very short sidetrack here. I have sometimes the impression when discussing with investors that they are maybe a bit too convinced about that. And what I mean about that is that they expect DLE to be so much of a solution that almost the entire world produced lithium out of DLE within two years, which is twice wrong, as you know. I mean, I'm not teaching anything to you, <laughs> but it's wrong because spodumene and evaporation ponds will not go away or not, at least not that fast. And second, within two years, nothing's going to happen. And the down downside of that is that when they expect something to drastically change that fast, then when they realize that it's not changing that fast, they are disappointed and then they can start disbelieving everything, even though it's just a natural course of events. So my two cents, what was your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring you? There are many, but talking to lawyers a few days ago, and it was they had a great commercial idea. So that makes me think you need any kind of people can have great ideas. So treat everybody the same and you will get great ideas for everybody. That's a cool one. Super short, profitability or growth? Can I take both? No. You have to pick. <laughs> so let's say profitability. What is the next profile you'll hire? And I'll use that question to mention that I saw that you have six job offers on your website. So probably if someone listening to that wants to reach out. We are having a lot of things to do. We are going to hire a, a project manager officer to take care of all that. So I think it's a, a very important and passionate place to work. Looking for someone in France or in Argentina? In France. When you hire that project manager or someone else, are you looking for sector experience, like lithium sector experience or startup experience? Can, can I add a third possibility or not? Yeah, sure. I should say, now if I need to choose, I should maybe choose 
sector experience, but most attitude, you know, it's a kind of positive, solving, happy and smiling. That's uh, very important. And then the rest, but, but sector experience, I guess. It is to fit your existing culture. Makes sense. Opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? <laughs> All your questions, I want to say both, but okay. Say, I, I find very funny opening new markets, but uh, let's say that one. But we are doubling down on Bright as well, don't worry. What's that tool nobody speaks about, but you couldn't live without? I still run marathons and make Ironman, so that's my tool to be okay every morning. Super cool. I never got that one. So <laughs> I don't know anything about two real tools, so forget it for that. I'm not a good example. What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile, which if I get right, is a mining company, needs to hear right now? Okay, we already say that we are we have the best process at the best price. And we are people in which you can trust. What are you desperately needing and you want to raise an open call for right now? I don't need anything desperate. <laughs> Thank God. Well, Gabriel, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot for the openness and answering all those Thank questions. And I'm looking forward to that sequel in six months. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Next time Bye. in Spalta, call me Gabriel and I will turn around and can talk to you. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.